Our sermon uh, text for this morning is uh, found in the book of Romans. So if you would like to turn there with me, we're going to look at Romans 8. We'll begin our reading in verse 14, and we'll read uh, through verse 17. So Romans 8, 14 through 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Pray with me now. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm already dreading the holidays, especially Thanksgiving. It's a time when invariably some distant relative or a friend of a friend at the table is going to ask, so Josh, what did you study for your PhD in Scotland? The last time I got that question in another context while my family was still in Scotland, I responded, I am studying Augustine's theological justification for coercion of religious heretics. I got, oh, that's nice. <laughs> And then this person actually politely moved his chair a few feet away from me. <laughs> I think he was afraid that I was going to attempt to coerce him into listening to everything I wanted to say about St. Augustine. Even worse though, as I anticipate the holidays, is the fear of that one very earnest person who somehow makes it to the Thanksgiving dinner table and who somehow, weirdly enough, has an obsessive interest in religious coercion. I imagine this person getting very close to me, perhaps pulling his chair close and asking me, did I hear you say you're studying how to coerce the heretics? <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> After three years studying Augustine for a PhD today, finally, I get a rare chance to talk about one of the practically useful things that St. Augustine had to say about the Christian life. But don't worry, I won't coerce you into staying here. You're always free to go. Today, I get to tell you what Augustine said about the fatherhood of God in a beautiful little sermon he preached on the Lord's Prayer. It's a reality we celebrated already when we recited the Lord's Prayer together, and it's a reality we found in each of the texts that we read this morning. Perhaps it's worth taking a few minutes to contemplate. In Sermon 7, Augustine says about the Lord's Prayer, he says, the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has taught us a prayer. And even though he is the Lord himself, as you have heard and have repeated in our creed, the only Son of God, yet he would not be alone. He is the only Son and yet would not be alone. He has decided to have brothers. For to whom does he say, say our Father which art in heaven? Whom did he wish us to call our Father except his Father? Did he begrudge us this? Of course, here Augustine wants us to say no. He goes on, parents sometimes, when they've had one, two, or even three children, fear to give birth to any more in case they reduce all of them to poverty. As a father of two, I can attest to this. But, he goes on, because the inheritance which Christ promises us is such as many may possess and no one be impoverished, therefore has he called into his brotherhood the peoples of all nations, and the only Son has numerous brothers who all say, Our Father, which art in heaven. We had a father and mother on earth that we might be born to labor and to death, but we have found other parents, God our Father, by whom we are born to life eternal. Let us then consider whose children we have begun to be, and let us live as becomes those who have such a father. According to Augustine in this sermon, as people who have our own earthly fathers, we can analogize upward to God as a father. We can imagine perhaps something even better than our earthly experience of a father. This is one aspect of God's condescension to us 
I want to reflect on today. Of course, as many of you will know, John Calvin famously said something similar to this when he said in the Institutes that, as nurses commonly do with their infants, God is wont in a measure to lisp in speaking to us. Part of God's fatherly condescension, of course, is that he teaches us by analogies. He teaches us about things we can't yet see by using the things that we can. As a son of a father myself, I'm struck increasingly, especially as I get older, by how meaningful this is, especially as I reflect on my own father who gave up academic aspirations to support my own. A father who, more tangibly, I think is still paying off the cost of my braces from high school. <laughs> I also anticipate this myself. I'm also struck by this as a father myself. I so often see myself attempting to explain things in terms that my two little boys would understand. You try, and I dare you, you try explaining to a two-year-old boy the critical point of difference between a digger truck, a dump truck, and a garbage truck. Now, the differences are there, but don't use Aristotle's categories. It won't help. <laughs> I tell you from experience, it can actually make things worse. <laughs> you have to find analogies. Often, the more concrete the analogy, the better it works. Now, admittedly, I'm an abstract sort of person. Those of you who work with me know I walk around with my head in the clouds most of the time. But I found that being a father has a tendency to pull me away from the abstract to the concrete. Reading Aristotle is all well and good, of course, but the substance that's now smashed into the carpet floor is chewing gum, <laughs> plain and simple. It just is. Reflecting on whether its stickiness is substance or one of its accidents just won't get it out of the carpet any faster. So I find that speaking to my little sons has forced me to simplify and concretize my language. I find myself putting aside the abstract for colorful and gritty. Those of you who are familiar with the earthiness of Hebrew metaphor, perhaps, could tell us about how God communicates certain things to his people in that way. So I don't tell my boys that I love them more than Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, although it has much to commend itself, to quote Kant precisely, act only in accord with that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law and also never leave gum on a carpet floor. <laughs> so I don't say I love you more than the categorical imperative to my son, I say I love you more than the ocean because they've been to the ocean now and they've seen how big it is. It's an easy comparison for them to make, but it's a hard thing to say sincerely if you're saying it while you're getting their gum out of the carpet floor. I'm fascinated by how often my boys learn by analogizing from their experience to things they don't quite understand yet. It's something I think that we often have to do when we contemplate God's love for us. Just a few months ago, before moving back to the States, when we were still living in Scotland, my four-year-old boy and I had a daily routine. Every morning, we packed up his, his daily necessities into his backpack. His tattered blue blanket named Beatna, his fluffy white cat he named Mao, and a little plastic garbage truck. Then I took him to nursery on my way into my study desk at the University of Edinburgh. One day, shortly before we moved back here, he noticed that I was going somewhere myself when I dropped him off. He could tell I was carrying bags with things. So he, he asked me, he said, Daddy, where do you go when you leave me at my nursery? At this point, I was scrambling to finish writing up a PhD thesis, and I didn't quite know how to explain that to my four-year-old, so I said, I said, Daddy goes to his nursery. <laughs> Daddy's, Daddy's learning how to be a teacher. Now this, of course, got his attention. He goes, a teacher, like one of my teachers at my nursery? I said, yeah, <laughs> it's like that. He said, well, Daddy, if you work very hard at your nursery, I will bet you that one of my teachers will let you come work with them and be one of their helpers. I say this, and I want this recorded. I did accept a professorship here, but there was stiff competition for me. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, what do your teachers teach you, buddy? He said, oh, lots of things, like we have to be kind to each other, and even if we get very upset with someone, 
we can never bite them. <laughs> I suspect it's not so different from the life of any teacher or professor. To our point today, though, my son thinks that teachers have one task, teaching him and his little friends to be kind and to try very hard not to bite each other. But as he grows, he'll learn. He'll learn how much more teachers can do, how we can learn from them math and science, language and art, and how to read and appreciate all kinds of books. And how teachers do sometimes bite each other. They just call it writing strongly worded emails. My hope, my hope is that my own sons one day will get the chance to interact with the kinds of teachers I've interacted with, the ones who have influenced me and changed my life for the better, some of whom are here at Knox. Most importantly, as Augustine says, we know that because God is our Father, that also means we are his children, and he loves us, which means we have our whole lives to figure out exactly what that means. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to you and calling you Father. As your children, we thank you for your guidance in our lives. We ask that as we go about the rest of our week, that we would be reminded anew of your grace to us in making us your children. We ask you all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen.